Hello and welcome, I'm Arumba. Thank you for joining me. Let's play some more Crusader Kings 2 in our tutorial series. So, um, I've just enabled the outliner, which is uh, a little pop-out that comes over on the right-hand side of the screen here and shows you various things that you might be interested in. This is in most Crusader King, or most Paradox titles, you'll have an outliner. Um, you can do things like um, message rules, you can you can affect things like your, your armies, trade, etc, etc. And this is one that I like to point out, in case you ever accidentally disable an alert, let's say you right click on it and then you turn it off and you can never see it again. If you ever have a disabled alert, you check that off, it'll show up over here and you can re-enable it. That's a, like probably the most frequently asked question on the forums is, how do I get my alerts back? And it's, it's done through the outliner. So we can see we've got the one city, or the one county, um, with its capital, the Dunasied, and we can see we've got the 7.7 .7 domain income and the three point, uh, 364 troops. And uh, we're going to go from there. So we are going to play. We're going to unpause the game and just let, let, some, let some stuff happen. There are a number of different holy places that you could visit on your pilgrimage. This is because we just took the decision to go on a pilgrimage. All of them are considered most sacred by the Holy Church, but a somewhat closer destination might mean a safer journey. Uh, sure, we'll go to a holy site in the west. We will visit the tomb of St. James in Santiago. That is located right down here. So our character is traveling. He's, he's leaving Desmond and traveling to Santiago. Um, we're currently, it still shows us as raining. But as soon as we actually leave, my things are packed. Everything is in order. I'm on, I'm ready to walk the way of St. James. My journey begins. Now we are on a pilgrimage and we have a regent. So because we are not at home, um, if we click on this, we can again see... It still shows us as raining in Desmond, but this is uh, this character modifier makes it so that we have a regent. So our son has taken over. He is technically in control of the country right now. He could make decisions, but he, he really won't do anything. And while he's regent, the uh, the scores for our, our country are going to be based on him. Notice how our state diplomacy is now affected by the regent. And because he's... Uh, He's not the actual, you know, the ideal ruler, the person that should be ruling. His wife's stats don't affect us. So there is a penalty to having a regency. Regencies can also happen if you're a child. You cannot be a ruler when you are under 16. You're not, not, you can be, you just can't have a, you can't have a no regency. My liege, my mission to Rome has so far been a success during my visit to the court of Pope Nicholas. I seem to have managed to make him understand what a benevolent and pious ruler you really are. So because we sent our court chaplain to Rome to improve religious relations, he has a 21.37% yearly chance of increasing relations with a priest. Um, he also has a 16% chance of decreasing relation between priest and spiritual leader. So what this means is that roughly once every, say, five years, and it could be much more than that, again, it's not, it's, it's statistics, it's not um, he, he could do it three times in a month, but on average, once per five years, he's going to improve religious relations with a priest in the target county. Now, since I sent him to Rome, and there's only the one bishop, in this case the Pope is considered a bishop, um, the only bishop he can improve relations with is the Pope. If there happened to be a bishopric in this holding, or in this, this county, he could accidentally improve relations with that bishop, because he's an idiot. You can't tell him which bishop you want him to improve relations with. He can only target a bishop in this county. Now, fortunately, again, he, he can only do it with the Pope, so he's always going to succeed. Um, and what this does is it increases his opinion of us by 30 for two years. Now, notice that there was that other option, though, too. Decreased relations between priest and spiritual leader. If you wanted to, you could have your court chaplain try to make your bishop like the Pope less. That's what that one means. There is a 16% chance that he could decrease the, the, the priest you're targeting his opinion of his spiritual leader, which is the Pope. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want your character to like the Pope less? Well, as a Catholic, you only receive taxes from your bishops if, the, if this guy likes you more than the Pope. In this case, our bishop's opinion of the Pope is 100. It's maxed out. 100 is the highest you can have. 
because they're both zealous. He's got a plus 30 bonus to opinion from the Pope being the head of the Catholic religion. Um, they're both diligent. The church view on zealous is, uh, is, is good and on chaste and state diplomacy of the Pope. Again, we covered state diplomacy in the last video, so notice how it's his opinion of the Pope is plus 15 state diplomacy. I'm going to give you one guess what the state diplomacy of the Pope is. Yep, 30. So anyway, we've uh, improved our relations with the Pope. Why is that important? Why do we want to do that? Well, if the Pope doesn't like you, he could excommunicate you, which is bad. <laughs> if the Pope excommunicates you, then that means that anyone that's nearby that's a Catholic can attack you because you're excommunicated and force you to abdicate or abdicate the throne. Um, also, if the Pope likes you tremendously, you can ask him for things. You can say, pretty please, can I have some money? <laughs> or, pretty please, could you grant me claims to some other territory? He's almost never going to accept, and I never really do it, but um, we'll talk about the Cardinal game, um, the College of Cardinals, how that all works, and, and how you can actually get your own people onto the seat of the papacy and then kind of use them <laughs> to, uh, to do things. So, um, expected next Cardinal, uh, my best candidate. Yeah, we're not really likely gonna, gonna spend a lot of worry about, about this. Interesting though, that, uh, this guy is more likely to succeed, even though we have 573 points, he should be more likely actually, but okay. So we have an event that's just happened. Traveling down a long and lonesome road, you come upon a man lying in a ditch. He seems to have been robbed and beaten up quite badly. Bind up his wounds, help him to an inn, and pay for his recovery, or leave him. He's probably dead anyway. Now, naturally, uh, we want to take the, the top option here. It does cost us 10 ducats, which could be considered a lot of money, but it's going to allow us to pick up one of the virtues. There are seven virtues and, and seven um, uh, deadly sins. And they're polar opposites. So that's what this little number means. This is the first deadly sin. This is the seventh virtue or the second virtue. And uh, if you have, say, the first virtue and you pick up the first deadly sin, it will delete the first virtue or vice versa. You can only have one or the other. Um, they're restricted that way. So this is the sixth virtue, being kind. This character's full of empathy. Uh, he's kind and full of empathy. Uh, humanitas is popular with vassals, but makes for a rather poor spy master. And then there in the tooltip, you can see how that's going to affect your traits and your, sorry, your stats. So if we take the kind trait, we're going to lose some intrigue, pick up some diplomacy. Our vassals will like us better by 10. So they have to be a direct vassal. And then anyone else in the entire game, anywhere in the entire game, whether they're a Muslim or they're an Indian or whatever, if they have the kind trait, they'll have plus 10 opinion of us as well because we have the same trait. If they have the opposite trait, the sixth deadly sin, then they will like us by six, by 10 less. So the reason we want this is because it, it affects all vassals. And the diplomacy plus two is just very good. So we'll take it. It also gets us pretty close to achieving our ambition of improving our diplomacy, which just requires us to get to eight. So we're up to seven already. We have arrived in Santiago, the oldest major pilgrimage site in the West. It is uh, an inland town close to the Atlantic Ocean with origins going back at least to the Roman Empire. The fabled way of St. James is a long road to travel and you have passed through many towns and villages on your way here. See, I kind of thought we would swim. You know, I don't know. I, it seems like a straight shot to swim that way. I don't know how many villages we'd pass, but... Legend holds that the St. James remains were brought here by ship from Jerusalem. They were lost at sea due to a storm, but soon after, they were miraculously washed ashore covered in scallops. Because of this, scallop shells have become a popular souvenir. Your mind dwells on the legends of this holy place as you make your way through the crowds. The saints, this holy ground, how it all moves my soul. I realize now that all my life up to this point has only been a preparation for this journey. How wondrous that the light of the Lord truly shines in me, a poor sinner. So because we went on our pilgrimage, we've just picked up the zealous trait. Now, most of the time, almost always, in fact, Zealous is a very, very, very good trait to have in this game because most war in Crusader Kings 2 is it's based on religion. You're going to have Catholics fighting Muslims. You're going to have um, Catholics fighting pagans. You're going to have Catholics fighting 
orthodox. I mean, you're going to fight, I mean, just, you're going to fight everyone that's not your religion. That's kind of the whole idea behind Crusader Kings is she's religious based. So being zealous makes you better at that stuff. You gain a ton of piety, which can be very useful for making the Pope like you. Um, he'll give you more money for your holy wars, etc. You get bonus martial score. The church likes it. Anyone that's of another faith, they don't like the fact that you're zealous. But who cares about them? I mean, they're, they're the wrong religion. We need to go convert them. Um, people who have the opposite trait um, will like you by less. What is the opposite of zealous? I forget. Um, we'll probably figure it out later. And then religious same trait opinion. So if someone else is Catholic zealous, then we're going to really, really like each other. Um, the Pope, I don't believe, is zealous. No, nope, the Pope is... Uh, no, he is. He is zealous. So he's going to really like us. We're going to have church opinion plus 10 and same trait opinion plus 30. So we're going to pick up 40 opinion with the Pope just for picking up zealous. Got to click on it to refresh and we're up to 70. So that's very good. You have finally returned, and we are now a pilgrim. So we're going to pick up this trait. The character has completed a great pilgrimage. We get monthly piety. And same faith opinion plus five, taking us to 70. Oh, interesting. So the Pope apparently is not going to actually have that modifier. Hmm. However, um, notice how he does like us a little bit more for piety. This is a, an, an interesting topic. Notice how religious characters... People who are part of a theocracy, like, say, our bishop. Notice how in this list of modifiers, there is no prestige score. Remember we talked about that a few videos back? It was 100 divided by your prestige floored. He doesn't care. The Pope doesn't care how prestigious we are, because he's a churchman. Churchmen care about piety. Your piety is a completely separate modifier, and the math on that is uh, it's 25 piety per one opinion floored again. So when we get to 75, we'll have plus three score for piety. And both prestige and piety get capped out at plus 20 opinion. You can't go past that. So at 500 piety, you have the maximum bonus to piety opinion. And at 2000 prestige, you have the maximum prestige bonus. So this is pretty good. He likes us quite a bit. Let's see if we can get anything from him. Um, request money. We would have to, it, it costs you piety to beg for money from the Pope, but uh, we might want to do that at some point. We don't have enough piety yet to ask him, but we will. We're going to ask him soon. Now that we're back home and the Regency is over, we're back in control of our country. We're still waiting on a claim. Now, one of the easiest ways to, to try to determine if you're able to actually go to war is to press the E key. He shows us our personal green territory. Now we have uh, the bluish purple. Um, I guess it's just blue, right? Or is that purple? Whatever, it doesn't matter. I would call it blue-purple. Blurple. This shows our allies. So because we're married to um, his daughter, he is our ally, and uh, we could call him to war. He is not guaranteed to join us, but we could call him to war. He's almost guaranteed to help defend us, but he doesn't have to go on offensive wars with us. Now, at the same time, we can see yellow on the map as well. Yellow is uh, countries that you're allowed to attack. So for some reason, we have the, the right to attack this guy. We can claim Tara. Um, we apparently have a strong claim on the petty kingdom of Tara. Not really sure why we started off with that, but nevertheless, we have the title of Desmond and we have a claim to something else. Now, without getting too complicated, we at some point need to discuss the difference between strong claims and weak claims, but for the time being, we have a strong claim on the petty kingdom of Tara. It can be inherited by our successor. Notice the green text there. That's saying that if I die, our son will still have this strong claim on the petty kingdom of Tara. Um, and then it says in the tooltip, on, strong, on succession, strong claims are only given to children who are second or third in line of succession. And first in line. So we've got three kids. Well, two kids. We've got my son, our grandson, and then our kinsman. Kinsman meaning that he's of our dynasty. Um, but uh, these people will all inherit claims to our territory. And uh, children, our children, which again, there's only one, will inherit our strong claim on Tara. How strong is this fellow? He has 483 troops. We can raise 439. 
So not quite enough to actually go to war. But we should probably make good on that claim. If we don't get it, we'll probably just go to war with this guy. Now when we picked up Zealous, our martial score went up to 10. So you'll notice that our penalty to levy is gone now. And we've picked up some more troops. Notice that green bar is starting to work its way closer to the right. Um, it's going to take some time for these troops to actually um, be reinforced. If you hover right there, you can see we're at 415 out of 468. Also, having our, our martial training troops will increase the levy reinforcement rate by 60%, allowing that levy to recover a little bit quicker. Now, we haven't talked about laws yet, but this is something we're going to want to change. There are laws that affect your feudal vassals, laws that affect your town vassals or your, your republican type vassals, and then laws that affect your theocratic or your churches. The one that is going to have the most impact generally on levy is going to be the feudal levies. But we don't have any feudal vassals. Remember, we just have a mayor and a bishop. So if I were to change a law that affects feudal taxation, it doesn't do anything. We don't have any feudal levies. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, we don't have any feudal vassals. On the other hand, if we were to, say, raise church levies or city levies, that would have an impact. But it would also make them like us less. What most characters or most players will do is they will immediately raise city taxes. But I find that usually levy is more important. Um, if you take money from your mayors, they won't upgrade their holdings. They won't buy things. If you leave them with their funds, they'll upgrade the thing and then you have more troops overall that way. Um, it's kind of a micro versus macro management perspective. I like to let, I usually like to let my vassals do most of the micro for me. They're fairly good at it. Um, we'll talk about upgrading things later. So I think this is a good spot for a break. Um, you can see a raised levy next to us. Uh, that would mean that you are in war. He's defending against King Halfdan Whiteshirt in the Sons of Lobrock invasion of Northumberland. So he's got his levy raised, but he's not doing anything with it. If he leaves, we might want to backstab him and go attack him. But unlike, say, EU4, where you can just declare a war with no Cassus Ballet, you have to have a Cassus Ballet in CK2. If you don't have one, you just physically cannot declare war. You, you always have to have some justification for it. There's no such thing as a no CB war in CK2. So, alright, I'm going to take a break here. I will see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you soon.